Thank you so much. Um, it's really amazing to be here and for so many people to show up. Um, I think the last time I gave the CATS lecture, there weren't that many people. There were a lot of people, though. Yeah, there were, too. There, there were? <laughs> I, it was a long time ago. Um, and I'm getting old. So, but this is amazing. Um, and hopefully I make sense. I realize I have a lot to say, and so I'm going to get to it. Uh, and I may skip over some stuff. But before I do anything, before I do anything, I want to acknowledge that this university, of course, as you know, sits on stolen land. And it's the land of the Duwamish people, the land of the Squamish people, and others who occupy this area. And I just um, hope that I can at least do some kind of justice in acknowledging uh, that theft and the role that universities all over the country play sitting on stolen land. Um, I also want to thank uh, Megan for not just for that wonderful introduction, but for all of her brilliant work over the years and how much I've learned from her, but also for this invitation. When you gave me, the, when you sent, you know, said the list of people who are coming, I know all those people, by the way, and they're amazing. So I may have to come up to check out some of those talks. Um, <laughs> and of course, to, to Kathleen Woodward, it's so great to be back again here. Always wonderful to be connected to the Simpson. Uh, center to Rachel, who I know is someplace here, who did a lot of work organizing, everyone else involved. Um, uh, this is my, oh, 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 and also one other thing before I start talking about, I'm going to talk about, um, this is also holy ground for me because this is where uh, Stephanie Camp, uh, who when one of the great historians, if not the greatest, was here on the faculty whose book I teach every year, Closer to Freedom, who was just an amazing person. And whatever I say tonight, all the good things I say that make sense are dedicated to her. All the dumb things I say are dedicated to my son who's giving me a hard time right now. So, um, so we'll see. Okay, so let me, let me get back, let me get to this. So first of all, um, it's great to be back in Seattle. Um, some of you may or may not know that I actually lived here. Uh, my brother, Shannon, is here, who I hardly ever see. And my nephew, Xavier, is here. Um, and so that's really wonderful. I have some fond memories of this place, and I have some terrible memories. And Shannon knows about the terrible, terrible and the fond memories. Um, I learned a lot of valuable lessons about racial capitalism here. In fact, we can learn some in two minutes. So, I arrived in Seattle beginning in the fourth grade, um, back in the 70s, early 70s, I should say, uh, on, and was involved in what on the surface was like an, a social engineering experiment called busing. Uh, we lived in Capitol Hill at the time on an apartment on the corner of Pine and Madison, um, but almost all the kids on our bus <coughs> were bused out to Ballard. And if, for those of you who don't know Seattle, Ballard was like a, a white community, very white, very Scandinavian. Um, uh, well, I don't know if it still is, but, you know, but that's how it was. Um, Central District was a black community. And let me say a little bit about that. So we were bused. I went to Laurel Heights Elementary School, then Marcus Whitman Junior High School. And most of the kids we picked up on the bus were in Central District. There was 23 of us. Now, I'm not going to talk about the psychological price that we paid, you know, being 23 kids, being bused to all white schools, and the kind of racism that we experienced from students and teachers, and what that meant, and the trauma it left on us, the imprint it left on us. I won't talk about that. I'm going to talk about value. Um, all the kids we picked up on that bus lived in the Central District, which was considered a ghetto. The value of their homes were considerably lower than they are now. The value of the schools that cater to these kids were considerably lower, which is the whole idea of being bused to these other schools. Um, busing was never about integration. It was concession to families struggling to educate their kids and those who recognize education as a form of cultural capital. Um, if you look at the Central District now, it's just not recognizable. I mean, a lot of us, we played sports for um, CAYA, Central Area Youth Association. Um, football, skiing, you know, only time we had a whole bunch of black kids skiing was through CAYA, you know? <laughs> and which is kind of an amazing thing, because people on the slopes didn't expect us Friday nights, you know? 
Um, it was a very different kind of thing, but that was the whole point. So gentrification and its transformation is not about integration, never was about integration. It's a modern form of settler colonialism. And with settlers come new restaurants and shops and rising property values and improved schools. Garfield in those days was not a good school. Now it's considered one of the best schools, you know? Um, it's, you know, and keep in mind that we used to go swimming in the pool, which was called Megar Evers. Um, we knew Megar Evers as the place where all the black kids go swimming. We didn't know who Megar Evers was. We learned over time. So, I mean, you got to keep that in mind that, you know, what this story illustrates in some ways is just the beginning of what I'm going to talk about tonight, and that is um, that racial capitalism, you know, in many, much of it's about value. You know, what Marx or Ricardo, Ricardo called exchange value is partly determined by things like race. Um, we can talk about that in Q&A if you want to, but exchange value is not the same as price. But in some respects, race does matter. Um, before we get into this question, what is racial capitalism and why it matters, I want to begin with just a few basic theses because I think I may run out of time and I'd rather stop before I'm done. But I just want to lay out a few things. One, um, race and gender are not incidental or accidental features of the global capitalist order. They are constitutive. Um, capitalism emerged as a racial and gendered regime. Or well, to put it another way, as Stuart Hall puts it, um, race, and I would add gender, are modalities in which class is lived. Now, second thesis. Um, race isn't simply or primarily about um, an identity. We confuse sometimes race with identity. It is a structure of power or means of structuring power through difference. So skin color is not an essential feature of racism. Okay, I know it's going to be like, what? My students don't believe that. Skin color is not an essential feature of racism. And, and I want to say that ahead of time because I'm going to say some things that might throw you off in terms of who's being racialized. Three, the central story of race and the making of the capitalist order isn't always the most obvious story. Okay, what do I mean is that the obvious stories like racial slavery, dispossession, imperialism, I'm not saying they're not really important, but it's not always about just those things. But rather, um, the, the story of race in the making of the global capitalist order uh, is also about the capacity of capital and the state to capture the white working class and tie its identity to race, that is to whiteness and masculinity. Um, so the secret to capitalism survival is racism and the racial and patriarchal state. Now, racial capitalism, you know, the genesis of the term, uh, you know, really comes out of South Africa. South African uh, scholars were among the first to really start to use that term in the 70s, mid-70s. Um, I won't go into the whole genesis of it, but it, it emerged as a kind of analytical framework to understand how the apartheid state structured relations of race, class, and accumulation. But it also came out of a political question. That political question was, um, when we dismantle apartheid, and we will, what, what's going to be left over? In other words, do we dismantle the racial state and its juridical elements, the law, um, or do we have to dismantle capitalism at the same time? So the question is, if we do that, would a post-apartheid nation still maintain the very structures that reproduce deep racial, class, and gender inequality? And that was a that's still a question that's being struggled over right now. So it makes sense that the concept of racial capitalism would emerge in South Africa where the racial character of South African capitalism was so obvious that the apartheid regime itself called itself a racial capitalist state. And they, they, they didn't even play. They, they were saying, this is what we are. I mean, well before the ascendance of the National Party in 1948 and the formal implementation of apartheid, um, you know, essentially all prior legislation, you know, state and corporate practices sought to do various things that are basically foundational racial capitalism. Strip Africans of land. Um, create a racially segmented and super exploited working class. Manufacture precarity through population transfer and by destroying black economic institutions. All the while they're doing this, 
using the, the surplus they, they are able to extract to create what might be called a whites-only welfare state. So much of that surplus is subsidizing what? Housing subsidies for white workers and white people, massive police state to maintain order, and to suppress non-white opposition. That can go on and on and on. But today, um, we tend to associate the term racial capitalism uh, with this man, Cedric Robinson. And I should say, by way of disclosure, he was my teacher. He was someone who, who passed away, um, sadly, 2016. And he was a person who was responsible for much of what I know about anything besides my mother. Uh, brilliant. Um, but we associate the term with him. He introduced the term in his book called Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition, in 19, published in 1983. And he developed it from the, the, he developed the concept of racial capitalism from a specific system, a description of a specific system, that is like apartheid or settler colonialism, to a way of understanding the general history of modern capitalism. Um, so building on the work of sociologist Oliver Cox, Robinson's objective was not to analyze the historical and contemporary sort of elements of racial capitalism. Instead, what he wanted to show was how European racism, racialism, and nationalism preceded capitalism. Preceded capitalism. In other words, it, it, it existed before capitalism emerged, when it emerged in the 13th and the 15th centuries, between that period. And in doing so, he directly challenged the Marxist idea that capitalism was a revolutionary break from feudalism. Now, capitalism and racism, he says, did not break from the old order, but rather evolved uh, from that old order, from the old feudal order, to produce a modern world system of racial capitalism dependent on slavery, violence, imperialism, and genocide. So as he put it, the tendency of European civilization through capitalism was thus not to homogenize, but to differentiate, to exaggerate regional, subcultural, and dialectical differences into racial ones, okay? And that's within Europe. That's to say that capitalism was racial not because of some conspiracy divide, to divide workers or to justify slavery and dispossession. They didn't have to work that hard to justify slavery because they had slavery within Europe. You know, they didn't have to make it up. I mean, slavery was just like common sense, right? But most importantly, that wasn't the, the, the purpose because racialism had already permeated Western feudal society. The first European proletarians were racial subjects. That's what he's saying. The first European proletarians were racial subjects. They weren't just Africans. They were Irish. They were Jews. They were Roma or gypsies. They were Slavs. And they were victims of dispossession, victims of enclosure, victims of, victims of colonialism and slavery within Europe itself. And in fact, he argues that racialization within Europe was very much a colonial process, okay? One involving processes of invasion, settlement, expropriation, and racial hierarchy. And he reminds us that what drove German colonization, the German colonization of Central Europe, for example, in the Slavic territories, was a racial ideology, the ideology of Herrenvolk. And the ideology of Herrenvolk presumed German racial superiority over the Slavs of Central Europeans. And he argues that you know, modern European nationalism was bound up with these kind of racialist myths, whether we're talking about Herrenvolk or Anglo-Saxonism or Celtism or Aryan and Nordic myths, we can go on. And that that history of colonialism begins in Europe itself and continues in Europe well after the New World settler colonialism, uh, well after the Berlin Conference in 1884-85, and it is the principal feature of both world wars. Anyone who studied um, World War II knows that when, when, Nazi, when the Nazis are talking about living room and, and taking property, that was about colonial domination over territories that they once uh, controlled earlier and then retook. So Cedric Robinson illustrates this point by examining 
the shifting and increasingly violent character of English colonization of Ireland in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. So the dispossessed Irish who were not killed uh, were ultimately dispersed and often ended up as indentured servants on, on ships to the New World uh, or in migrant labor uh, on the English mainland. And it was those historical circumstances of subjugation of colonialism, um, those historical experiences that shaped Irish nationalism and determined their relationship with the English working class and rendered them an inferior race. This is way beyond the, the scope of the talk, but if you read like the first section of black Marxism, it's about Europe. And my students are like, oh, we don't want to read about Europe. I said, but you got to begin there. You got to begin there because this is where race begins, in Europe, right? In any case, Racial capitalism, then, is not merely a type of capitalism, okay? And I know some of you are undergraduates forced to come here. <laughs> I know I could see you. So I'm telling you what to take notes on, okay? So take notes on this. So racial capitalism is not merely a type of capitalism, say, as opposed to like non-racist capitalism. You don't have non-racist capitalism. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a non-racial capitalism. It only exists in the minds of economists who themselves are thinking in racial terms, <laughs> right? So the term simply signals that capitalism develops and operates within a racist system or a racial regime. Um, racism is fundamental for the production and reproduction of violence, and that violence is necessary for creating and maintaining capitalism. Why is that? Well, first of all, um, capital didn't begin with money. Okay, that's not where capital begins. Money is just a medium of exchange. Capital begins with seizing control of natural resources, there's land, water, fuel, uh, and creating cheap labor to turn these resources into commodities. And that, when I say violence, that violence is cutting many ways. Violence is directed at all life and the land itself, the earth itself. Um, also, the imperial imagination envisioned the world of savages. So once you get beyond, um, I wouldn't even say that, because even within Europe there are those who are identified as savages. But once you get beyond into the expansion of the Atlantic uh, uh, trade, the whole world, and, and the, the, the Asian trade, the whole world are deemed savages whose labor and land was there for the taking, sanctioned by God. Now, since much of the land and resources were held in common, and I just want to emphasize this point, this is the world. Most of the world, much of the land and resources are held in common. You know? Um, it meant forcibly dispossessing people and turning them into cheaper, cheap labor or unfree labor, and, those, and that labor was used to make things and grow things. Um, this is very important because we've grown up in a world where private property is seen as a natural thing. Like private property is like a natural right. When for centuries it's the other way around. Access to the earth and its abundant resources was the natural right. I mean, look, I got, someone bought this water. They had to buy it and I'm drinking it, you know, out of a plastic, you know, water's privatized. Everything, now you have to buy. You can't walk on property now because property is private. So what I'm saying is that the commons is, is what's been natural for centuries. It's the dispossession from the commons and the construction of private property as a concept. Even when I said at the very beginning of my, my, my talk, I said I, I paid tribute to the indigenous people on the land. And sometimes we confuse what it means to be on the land, what it means to own the land. <coughs> you don't have a concept of ownership, so I'm not saying they own the land. It's a very different way of thinking about the land, right? Okay? Anyway, I don't want to get off topic. Um, so this requirement for resources and for labor is really behind conquest, behind colonization, uh, dispossession, slavery, and environmental destruction, right? These are the five processes in the creation of modern capitalism and white supremacy. Um, this is why we need to think about racial capitalism not just in national terms, but in global terms, from its inception. Okay? It's no accident that the global division of labor reflects this history with the lowest paid 
in the most precarious workers in the global economy uh, being descendants of who? Of slaves, descendants of the colonized, descendants of the dispossessed. Now, capitalism structures not just the public realm, which is what we tend to talk about, but also the private. So any critique of racial capitalism means that we have to understand the role of paid and unpaid women's work in social reproduction and how this work is racialized. Okay, so reproductive labor, for example, is outsourced, um, especially as incomes and wages decline and precarity rises, uh, both the use of paid services, but also, uh, you know, we talk about the globalization of care, that is immigration, immigrant domestic workers, these are all racialized labor, you know. Um, and so paid services, paid domestic services, becomes a real engine in the economy, but also um, explains in some ways um, the, the fact that we have uh, probably the, the, the largest migratory um, uh, labor force in, in history ever, you know. Uh, we also know from the work of people like Sylvia Federici and others that privatization of the household under heteropatriarchy and the precarity created by neoliberalism, for example, puts women at greater risk of domestic violence, of slavery and trafficking. When I say slavery, I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about slavery today. It's about 44 million slaves, unfree labor in the world today. And many of those slaves are sex slaves, right? We've, you're all being you know, bombarded with interesting stories about the discovery, the revelations of uh, sexual violence and sexual harassment. Um, and just so you know, these are revelations of a very massive and old process. These are not like new things. Um, and this, in fact, not only that, but they're very central to the reproduction of the system of capitalism. And, and although many of the high profile cases are not women of color, women of color are usually the ones who are most affected um, by these uh, processes. So women are also at the forefront of resistance. Um, many of the, the anti-systemic struggles of the last century uh, have really been waged not by industrial workers, but by women who are peasants, campesinas, um, by subsistence farmers, many of whom are women, uh, by urban squatters, many of whom are women, undocumented migrants, welfare recipients, uh, women, often women who are in gender non-conforming families, been at the forefront. But we don't always see that as like the, the, the wedge resisting capitalism, because we have this kind of romantic view of the industrial worker in the shop floor. Um, so what I'm gonna do now with the time I have is very quickly sweep through certain historical epics, make a few points, spend some time on the neoliberal racial order uh, with one particular story, and then say something about Trump at the end, okay, <laughs> if I have some time, so. And keep in mind that don't think that we actually started at seven, because we did not. <laughs> Remember, we, we started much later. Uh, I, 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 I got to hear all these great things about, about me, um, and so don't, don't blame me for that, so. Okay, so let's, let's begin with something simple. Um, I don't have a lot of slides, but I have a few that are coming up. So let me just say a few, like two minutes on settler colonialism and the emergence of racial slavery, because I want to say something slightly different. Um, now, what made North America really unique as a settler society uh, was slaves. The vast importation of African slaves, and you also have enslaved um, indigenous peoples as well, many of whom were actually Ex, uh, exported, sold to, to the Caribbean, that's another story. But the problem of settlers, the problem that settlers faced um, was sort of twofold. One, dispossessing indigenous peoples. Uh, and two, managing, actually it's just threefold, uh, managing coerced African labor. Because remember, um, you can't call Africans immigrants or migrants. They were stolen. They were prisoners. They were incarcerated. In fact, you know, we have to be really careful when we talk about like how racial slavery emerges in North America. It's just not true. I, this is way beyond the scope of my talk, but racial slavery begins at the point of capture. 
it doesn't begin in North America. It's not like people are like, oh, well, I thought I was an indentured servant. What are you doing? What, I, how come I can't leave? No, that's not how it worked. They were enslaved at the point of capture. But the third aspect of management was how to manage an unruly white working class, the rural poor, those, those same people who are themselves colonized and dispossessed out of Ireland who end up on a boat and end up as indentured servants. Because managing the white poor and the enslaved meant enclosure. In England, enclosure is a little bit easier than in North America because they didn't have the capacity to enclose. Um, you have vast landscapes whose boundaries can't be defended easily. So keep in mind, as all this is happening in North America, North America's colonies, there's a pitched battle taking place in England at the same time over the commons. And there's a real fear among colonial rulers in the, that landless white people and the indentured servants would be, start to escape with Africans. And they started doing that. They started running away with Africans. They began to join mar maroon uh, societies. They joined with native peoples. And it was dangerous because suddenly white folks who didn't see any future for themselves except as bonded labor suddenly saw a future with native peoples and Africans. In other words, an alternative to the capitalist relations of production and class rule. So the white rule is like, we've got to do something about this. So no surprise, it, with all this is happening, that's when the discourse of Indians as idle comes up at the very onset of the colonial period. And it was a capital crime, in fact, for English to live with Indians. Yet by the late 18th century, according to one observer, there were thousands of colonists, that is former indentured servants or indentured servants who ran away and had become what they called new made Indians, living as hunters, fishers, fishing, gathering, that sort of thing. So they got around the problem by extending land grants to white people, um, effectively ending forms of white bondage. White bondage would have probably continued had it not been for this pressure. And so the freeing, so what, we, what we're seeing is not so much the consolidation of racial slavery, but the freeing of forms of white bondage, the creation of a settler class, turning them into citizens and property owners. That was key. It made them white, it made them free, it made them settlers, and that identification allowed them to identify with the, uh, identify with the ruling regimes. Now, this didn't mean that they saw themselves as capitalists or that there was no antagonism between them and the owners of capital. Rather, it meant at least two or three things. One, it meant that they came to see non-white labor as subordinate, as inferior, and whose interests and fate are not linked to theirs. Okay? And some of the more, quote unquote, radical elements saw non-white labor as an obstacle to their revolution as a proletariat. Secondly, and probably more significantly, by identifying as settlers, they saw themselves as future capitalists, as future slaveholders, as future cap captains of industry. So with emancipation on a global scale, colonial officers and free market liberals, in this case, John Stuart Mill is both, by the way. <laughs> He's a <laughs> colonial officer and a free market ideology. Um, so th these figures turn to what we might call and I have to say with apologies to, to my friend Moon over here, the three C's. The three C's, coolie labor, uh, the continuation of convict labor, and in the colonies, corvée labor, okay? Unfree labor, okay? And I'm not the first to say this, but I just want to say, I'm just repeating what other people have said, unfree labor is almost like the, more the norm than free labor, okay? Uh, now, a couple things about this. Who, who, is, who, are, who is coolie labor? Who is convict labor? Who, who constitutes corvée labor? That is forced labor. Um, these are men and women, I should say. And I want to say something about women. Women of color recruited for domestic service, uh, recruited as nurse, nurses, um, and of course, reproductive labor for male wage earners. But they're also included in all three C's. Victorian gender norms don't apply to African and Asian women, um, they still perform the bulk of agricultural labor. They may not make up significant proportions of 
you know, uh, Asian migrant labor, especially as um, more limits were placed on migration, but they were left behind to care for children, to work in agriculture or in emerging industries. For black women, African women, besides domestic worker, to domestic labor, they were consigned to what would be considered quote unquote men's work. They built roads. They worked on plantations. They collected rubber in the Congo. Um, in other words, they are considered what my, my friend and colleague Sarah Haley calls ungendered labor. They're ungendered, they're, they're gender stripped in some ways. It's not just being masculinized, it's basically being recognized as having no gender limits in terms of their, their labor. Um, at the same time, uh, women were often in positions of being independent producers uh, in, the in the realm of, of, of the colonies, whether it means making cloth or growing small plots, uh, vegetables and small plots of land. Um, but then mass production undermined their autonomy. And let's say something about mass production. So over time, especially as we move into the 20th century, and forms of industrial capitalism as we, you know, what we know as Fordism. Um, you know, workers are not just producers under Fordism. Workers are increasingly becoming consumers, okay? Uh, what this means is that something like finance. Finance was so essential to backing colonial projects um, and backing the slave trade. In fact, Lloyds of London, you know, much of its capital, um, and much of his, his, his business was, fi was uh, actually insuring slave ships. But, um, but finance is very, very important. And early manufacturing enterprises um, also depended on finance. So by the time you get to the 20th century, financial institutions begin to extend credit to workers. And that enables them to consume more and they can afford more, although uh, their existing wages are not going up significantly. Under Fordism, as more and more commodities become available, the, you know, um, cheaper than they were before, um, it's not just survival that's keeping them working, it is debt. Debt becomes a driver. Um, in, in other words, we, th we think so much before this moment of working as a way to just reproduce your labor power for the next day. Now it's about commodity, it's about accumulation, it's about having things and debt keeps you continuing to work and work. Um, and they pay that debt back with interest. Capitalists, on the other hand, can park their surplus in banks and they can profit from financial ventures. So investments in stocks, in loans to workers and to businesses at high interest rates, credit cards come into being by the middle to late uh, 20th century, prime and subprime mortgages, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and as we know from Peter Hudson's really great book, Bankers and Empire, which is out now, you should check it out. We know that, you know, that colonial and racial regimes allowed U.S. banks to use the Caribbean and to use sovereign debt as a way to invent new global uh, financial instruments, to pry open new markets, and to accumulate huge sums of wealth while evading U.S. regulatory regimes. And that's another way where racial capitalism is functioning. So immediately we begin to see how the system is racial. Race and gender and citizenship status, status determines wages, uh, it determines employment opportunities, it determines the kind of labor you do, whether it's skilled, unskilled, unprotected, unpaid, paid, access to credit, uh, to loans, to interest rates, charge, that sort of thing. All this is shaped by value, racial value in some ways. So differential access is determined by race, gender, and class. Now, let me just jump now to more present stuff, and that is financialization and racial neoliberalism. Okay? So, I want to turn to the restructuring of capitalism um, uh, or racial neoliberalism, which itself is a response to capitalism's crisis in the 70s. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, shift to neoliberalization of racial capitalism through um, a story that I want to tell about Flint, Michigan. Okay? Um, but the story of Flint is a story of financialization, it's a story of security regimes, it's a story of the assault on democracy. And um, it's a story that many of us know, but I want to say a little bit more than what we probably know. So many of you know about um, 
beginning about four years, three, four years ago, uh, you know, the Flint water supply was poisoned. And you may know that in 2013, the governor of Michigan, Rick Snyder, appointed an emergency manager, uh, a man named uh, Darnell Early, to take over Flint's government in order to impose austerity measures to reduce the city's debt. Um, by the way, um, the story I'm about to tell is very similar to Puerto Rico right now. Uh, you can see a lot of similarities. We could talk about that in Q&A if you want to. Um, so to save money, uh, Early decided to switch the public water supply from the Detroit River to the Flint River. The problem with the Flint River was polluted. Everyone knew it. It was highly toxic. Um, and to save money, the new regime, that is an uh, unelected regime, unelected um, emergency manager, stopped chemically treating the city's lead pipes, which made matters worse. So the results were that you know, residents were getting sick, and that's what their water looked like. So residents continued to receive water bills for that water. Okay? So of course they organized. So let's look at the larger picture to understand the neoliberalization of racial capitalism. First of all, over half of Flint's population is black. And they make up the largest proportion of residents living below the poverty line. And Flint is the second most impoverished city in the nation next to Youngstown, Ohio. Secondly, black communities are especially subject to this kind of corporate state dictatorship, the, the idea of the emergency manager system, which imposes authoritarian governance in the name of austerity. Okay? Um, in Michigan, for example, 49% of the African American population, at least two years ago, had no locally elected government and were under emergency managers. Black people make up about 14% of the state's population. In Detroit and Highland Park, and by the way, my wife's um, late uncle was mayor of Highland Park for many years. Um, uh, the financial crisis was used to justify gutting public workers of their pensions and privatizing and raising the cost of water. So you have organizations like the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization and Blue Planet Project that went to New York, went to the United Nations to make the case that water is a human right. And they actually got support for this position. Uh, and that shutting off water to those who can't afford to pay their bills is a human rights violation. Okay, now, this, we, know, we know this part of the story. This part of the story we don't always know is like, how come so many residents can pay their bills? Or better, how did cities like Flint and Detroit, once so having the highest paid workers in the country, thriving industrial workforce, become so poor and so unequal? Okay, and that's the story I want to tell a little bit about. So in 1960, Flint had one of the highest per capita incomes in the United States. General Motors was the main employer, and workers won strong wages and job protections because of intense union struggles. It wasn't a giveaway. Uh, and also the post-war growth of, of the US economy. During the 1970s, as manufacturing processes became more mobile, companies like GM, Ford, left Michigan, not entirely, but many of their processing, uh, manufacturing processes uh, went for cheaper labor. They moved to, uh, to the U.S. South. They moved to Mexico. Um, they opened up shop in South Africa. They've been there for a while, Brazil. And through free trade agreements, they paid even less in taxes and duties and set up shop in places with few environmental or labor regulations. So these shifts both produced and were responses to the global economic crisis of the 1970s, the global slump of 74 in particular, and also the oil embargo, uh, the competition from automakers like Japan and Germany. In order to keep GM uh, in Flint, because they didn't want GM to leave, the city uh, government agreed to give the company huge tax cuts and promised immunity, and write this down, for those of you who are going to write about it in your class, 
promise immunity from legal consequences for polluting the river, right? So, you know, you can pollute the river, we're not gonna fine you, go ahead and do it, you know? Um, and so the Flint River, that's how Flint River becomes massively polluted. So GM made billions of dollars in profits, and where did the money go? Did it go back into Flint? No, it went to the shareholders rather than the city. Because that's what capital does. They're not interested in the city. They're interested in shareholders. Um, and accumulation, and trying to deal, do something with that surplus. But jobs still disappeared, and it disappeared through outsourcing, through reduced shifts, through automation. And so by 19, uh, between 1979 and 2010, Flint still lost 87.5% of its manufacturing jobs. Okay, which is so interesting because again, think about all the giveaways that the city and the state's giving them not to leave, and they're still losing jobs. So with GM, with their shares use, uh, losing value, like many US man manufacturing firms, they turned to finance. Namely, GM entered the consumer finance market. They sold insurance packages, they went to banking services, and they sold mortgages home equity loans to the members of the public. And by 1999, GM was deeply involved in selling subprime mortgages to people who were unlikely to pay them back. Um, and the result was predatory lending, okay? Um, working people, overwhelmingly black working people, lost their homes as well as their jobs. And when the variable rate on the mortgages ballooned, and the housing market collapsed, and that's what we, when we talk about the 2008 crisis, this had a domino effect on the economy. Um, the domino effect left cities like Flint with really a fraction of the tax revenue. Because of course, tax revenue is generated by property taxes. And if the property, if people are not in your house, and the property values decline, you're not generating much revenue, okay? So, what's worse, is those tax breaks given to the very corporations that fleeced the city, right? Um, and ultimately, the city fell deeper into debt, okay? And they couldn't get back those, the tax revenues from, from GM. So in order to try to come out of debt, what do they do? The city does what a lot of neoliberal cities do. They turn to privatizing public assets in order to attract investment capital. So public lands are sold off to developers. Um, water rates increase, and there's a push to privatize water. Uh, downtown redevelopment schemes are encouraged using public funding, public debt, and substantial tax breaks, more tax breaks, the private firms to finance new buildings, skyscrapers, parking lots. Um, and so the thing is, if they can't pay back that debt, then it's a loss. None of these ventures revitalize downtown. None of these ventures revitalized the economy. It left the city of Flint <coughs> responsible for massive debt. And that massive debt became justification for moving the city council aside and putting an emergency manager in place to manage the debt. You see? Like Puerto Rico. <laughs> so, continue our story very quickly. Back in 2014-15, when it was clear that the water wasn't fit for human or animal consumption, the city council tried to reverse the decision. The people opposed it, uh, but the emergency manager refused. Uh, what we know now is that Darnell Early was actually part of a plan, and that plan was to push Detroit into bankruptcy, you know, to completely privatize the water supply. So what do I mean by that? So the Detroit Water and Sewage um, Department was operating with massive, huge budget deficits. So their bondholders were faced with potential loss of Flint as a customer. So they didn't want to lose Flint as a customer. So they placed greater pressure on delinquent customers to pay off, um, to pay their bill. So they'll cut off services to people, raise rates on Detroiters, um, and Detroit's water agency then offered to cut its rates in half to Flint residents. But Donna Early was like, you know, um, no, don't cut the rates. So he had a chance to cut the rates, but then we, he said, we're going to continue to use Flint uh, river supply. And then Jerry Ambrose, who replaced Donna Early, uh, did the same thing. So instead, what they did was, and you could write this down, 
they signed an agreement with a private firm called Veolia to handle water management. Um, so it's no coincidence that when Detroit's emergency manager, this is Detroit, Kevin Orr, was pushing to raise water rates and cutting off services to poor families behind the payments, uh, he had begun negotiations, negotiations with who? With Veolia. And in fact, it was under Orr's leadership that by, 19, by 2014, rather, the city had shut off water to over 150,000 residents who were behind in their bills and began making plans to eliminate hundreds of jobs. So the shutoffs and the layoffs were really a strategy, as I suggested before, to make the Detroit Water and Sewage Department more attractive for private investors, like PREPA in Puerto Rico, which is the, the power grid. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to the story, and I'm not going to go much more, more into this, but we know that Darnell Early's decision was pushing Detroit into bankruptcy and the complete privatization of water supply. What we see with Flint, therefore, are not only the consequences of neoliberalization of racial capitalism, which includes the dismantling of democracy, but we also see, um, and don't be mad at me for saying this, but the rise of a black political class that serves as junior partners in these forms of authoritarian governance. Okay? So you got the black face, right, of authoritarianism, all in the name of multiculturalism and diversity. <laughs> See, diversity could jack you up, I'm telling you. <laughs> you gotta be careful. So I, I wanna close with some words on Trump, but I wanna make a transition here. So the story of Flint, of course, is being replicated in Puerto Rico. It should remind us, I think, above all, that the authoritarian turn that we thought began in November 2016 was already in process. It didn't begin with Trump. We have at least four decades of globalization, neoliberal attacks on the welfare state, on public institutions, on the poor, covert wars, political and cultural backlash against movements for racial and gender justice, rampant xenophobia, open misogyny, attacks on reproductive rights, a backlash against diversity, multiculturalism, all that way before Trump was elected. So what ends up happening is the image of, of Obama as kind of like the last gasp of liberal democracy ends up obscuring or masking a global shift toward authoritarianism. And this is what Megan was saying, actually, um, Professor Francis, I'm sorry, um, in, in, in her introduction. This is a shift that emerged in response, in response to capitalist latest crisis um, and the mass global resistance movement that emerged in the wake, uh, in, this, in the wake of the, of the crisis. So some of you may remember this. Um, so some of you are old enough to remember 2008, right? Some of you may remember 2009. Um, but 2010 was this explosion, right? Remember that? Uh, in 2011, so that whole period you have, you have Occupy, you have Athens and Madrid and, and Sao Paulo and London and the West Bank, and all these like uprisings that are challenging um, the sort of the, the, the crisis of global capital. So I'm convinced that, you can write this down, that the massive opposition to globalization and to the policies of austerity, as policies designed to solve capitalism's crisis on the backs of workers, on the backs of the poor, both exposed and hastened the crisis that produced Trump. So Trumpism wasn't just sort of like, you know, bad democratic planning, you know, um, it wasn't, it was so much more than that. In other words, I, you know, we could have predicted it, you know, and some people did, had we paid attention, okay? Although I'm very proud to say that, um, it was sad to say, I was giving a talk at Columbia the week before the elections, I said, you know, Trump's gonna win. And people were like, boo, I said, watch. <laughs> people still talk about that. It's on, it's on film if you don't believe me. Someone filmed it. Um, 
So to understand, this is what I want to sort of close with, so to understand this current moment that we're in, I, I think it's worth revisiting. Um, actually, I put that picture up there, I like this. This is, this, is, this is the picture I meant to talk about with respect to the last gasp of liberal democracy. Um, you know, the Obama years, you know, we get nostalgic for them because what we're dealing with is so stupid, right? Um, but there's some terrible things that happened in those days that we kind of forget about. Um, but they look good. But, but then again, I mean, people think George W. Bush is looking good. <laughs> that's, that's what's amazing to me. Just, let's just say Reagan's looking good. Um, but anyway, to go back to the story. Um, so to understand this current moment, I think it's worth revisiting um, Stuart Hall, who also left us um, not long ago. Uh, but Stuart Hall wrote this book in 1988 uh, called The Hard Road to Renewal, Thatcherism and the Crisis of the Left. It's a very, very important collection of essays. And in this collection, he, took, he was sort of arguing with British Marxists in the Labor Party. Uh, and they took him to task for failing to grasp the way in which popular consent can be mobilized by incorporating um, popular disconsent, discontent rather, uh, and then net neutralizing it. So according to, to Hall, Thatcherism forged a relationship between free market liberalism and traditional conservative themes like family, nation, patriarchy, respectability, much like Reagan. Themes that emerged in the context of what Hall calls a crisis of national identity and culture precipitated by the unresolved psychic trauma of the end of empire. So in other words, to make Britain great again uh, really meant to restore the old order of Anglo-Saxonism, you know, this racialized patriotism and heteropatriarchal authority. And that's still with us. There's this sort of interesting tension in England right now um, that's still there. Hall was writing against a group of Labor Party Marxists who really were unable to see how the working class had actually been recomposed in the 20th century, didn't look the same way as they imagined it. Um, it you know, and in fact, it was not unified. It, was, it couldn't be unified so easy because it wasn't homogenous. It was divided. It was divided by race, it was divided by gender, and it was fractured. So a lot of the Marxists did not acknowledge this, but they see the divides of identity of race and gender, for example, and sexuality as chimeras of false consciousness. And Stuart Hall was like, no, they're not. You know, he said that if we don't actually see the historical trajectory in the formation of identity, it makes it impossible to see class rule um, as like a single class, not as a single class rather, but as an historic block. Let me just say it again. So we, he's saying that you know, we make the mistake of thinking of class rule as one class ruling another, the lower class and the upper class, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And he's saying, no, class rule is an historic block that can incorporate both elements of finance capital and industrial capital and elements of the working class. In other words, elements of the working class could participate in class rule, could actually support the ruling class and have a stake in it. And he's saying that you know, there's reasons for that. Some of that stake has to do with things that are considered non-objective, like race. Okay? So in the US, in the 1990s, we see similar attacks taking place from the left on how identity politics undermine class politics. I was involved in some of those debates in those days. Some of the young professors here were like in elementary school at the time when I was fighting those battles with Todd Gitlin and people like that, but that's you know, way back in the past. Um, some, I could say that you know, some of the people I argued with and debated with in the, early, in the sort of early 90s, they're dead now and I'm still here, which makes me right. Um, <laughs> so, actually my, my grandfather used to say it all the time. He said, you know, they're dead and I'm here, so I'm right. You know? In any case, to go back, so, um, so in the 90s, you see similar attacks, and in some ways, this attack on, you know, from the left, on how identity politics undermine class politics, or its liberal variant, which is that 
you know, identity politics undermined a unified American identity based on enlightenment principles of individualism, liberty, and secularism. And lately we've seen the resurrection of this, we've seen the resurrection of Richard Rorty's 1998 book, Achieving Our Country, which the New York Times had a whole thing about, and in the recent publication of Mark uh, Lilla's uh, The Once and Future Liberal. Now these and similar critiques, I'm not going to go into details about that, um, I argue mistake or confuse ideology, that is, a categorical opposition to racism, sexism, homophobia, and institutional oppression, and marginalization based on difference for identity politics. They confuse the two. They think that when you actually have a categorical opposition to these forms of oppression, that is equal to identity politics. Okay? And they presume that the white working class operated purely out of a kind of race and gender neutral economic interest. But all the other people are driv driven by their race and their gender and their sexuality. So most pundits, of course, repeat this error. They insist that Trump appealed not to white racism, but to legitimate working class populism driven by class anger. But if this were true, then you would think logically that all working people would be attracted to Trump, unless they're just smarter, you know? So you would think, well, Trump would win over all black and brown voters because they're the lowest rungs of the working class. And they suffer disproportionately from some of the policies that he claimed, claimed to stand up against, um, more than whites during the financial crisis of 2008. Instead, Trump's victory inspired a wave of kind of you know, racist attacks and, and emboldened white nationalists to flaunt their allegiance to the president-elect. So for the liberal critics of identity politics, the real culprits are people of color, the queer people, the feminists, liberal Democrats who alienated the white working class, driving them into the arms of Donald Trump. Now, there are liberal Democrats who alienated all kinds of people just because they're bankrupt. You know, but that's different, that's a different story. <laughs> and I said it, the Democratic Party is bankrupt and has been for some time. I didn't mean, I didn't realize that literally bankrupt, um, but we <laughs> found out that they're literally bankrupt. Um, and I wrote that a year ago. You know, it's gonna actually be reprinted in Boston Review, I think tomorrow or the next day, so check it out. Um, they said that, you know, I wrote this piece right after Trump. I stayed up all night, wrote it in my re in response and apparently a lot of stuff that I said, including about Puerto Rico, all turned out to be true. So it turns out I'm right again, you know? <laughs> what can I say? I'm still living, you know? Um, so they're going to reprint that. But, but again, it, instead, you know, um, these are the people who, get, who are seen as the kind of culprits. Um, so the argument, this argument that, you know, identity politics and, and all these people of color and, and you know, queer people and feminists and stuff are the real sort of problem is an old argument. It's inept, it's confused, and it's very, very old. The movements associated with identity liberalism, as Mark Lilla would have us believe, have actually not been obsessed with narrow group identities, but with forms of oppression. They've been concerned about exclusion. They've been fighting marginalization. And none of these movements today have been exclusionary. Black Lives Matter is not an exclusionary or organization. You know? um, they're wide open. Prison abolitionists, it's not exclusionary. Uh, movements for LGBTQ rights, immigrant rights, reproductive rights, struggles against Islamophobia, these are not exclusive movements. They are serious attempts or serious efforts to interrogate sources of persistent inequality, the barriers to equal opportunity, and the structures and policies that do harm to some groups at the expense of others. The irony, of course, is that the most exclusive organizations are like the Nazis, the alt-right, and the Klan. I've been trying to get in the Klan for years. They will not <laughs> take my application, right? But, I, but all those other organizations I could be a part of, right? So, just in closing, actually, no, I didn't want to put that slide up there. Um, that's my last slide. So just to close, to quote Cedric Robinson's friend and colleague, the late Otis Madison, he said, 
and you can write this down. The purpose of racism is to control the behavior of white people, not black people. And you can extend that, say, black, brown, other people. For blacks, guns and tanks are sufficient. Okay? So the purpose of racism is to control the behavior of white people, not black people. For blacks, guns and tanks are sufficient. In other words, racism, not anti-racism, constitutes the identity politics that helps seal Trump's victory. The alt-right races a Nazi salute. Klansmen shoot black demonstrators in front of the police and walk away. And for the people of Ferguson and Baltimore and elsewhere, guns and tanks are sufficient. Thank you. So, thank you. So we have time for questions, comments, thoughts, and stuff like that. I didn't go on too long. And I'm going to ask you to stand up, if you would. Yes. So I um, just want to start off by thanking you. Okay. Uh, I know you have definitely influenced a lot of people in this room as far as our thinking and our writing goes. Uh, my name is Enrico. I'm a okay. second year graduate student in the Department of Cultural Studies at oh. U of Buffalo. Oh, great. And I have a lot of people in my cohort, past cohorts, new cohorts with me today. Um, I'm wearing a shirt for Palestine uh, yes. because I know the black radical tradition has a deep solidarity mm -hmm. with the Palestinian um, sort of equality and mm -hmm. liberation movement. Um, and there right now is a lot of sort of anti BDS legislation. Yes, going on yes. In Dickens from Texas in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. Mm -hmm. And I myself am from Inglewood. I'm from, I'm from South Central LA. Okay. And the question that brings us all together is, we as students, scholars, activists, people who sort of inhabit this space between all of these different identities and, mm -hmm. and, and occupations, um, have to deal with, for example, gentrification of the Central District, right. what have you. And I, I just wanted to get your gauge on, one, what our government, our sort of systems of power are doing to prevent us from getting to these spaces, working against forces like gentrification, mm -hmm. and what you think practical, pragmatic avenues of intervention are for us to engage in as we continue our study. Right. Those are great questions. And by the way, I so appreciate you calling out Palestine and the attacks on BDS. By the way, people should pay attention to the attacks that are taking place right just south of here at San Francisco State University, where Professor Rabal Abdullahi has been, under, they've been waging war against her, trying to get her fired, simply uh, for teaching and supporting students who want to work on Palestine. Um, and, and because she's identified with someone who's tied to, to BDS. And the irony, of course, is that um, boycott, divestment, sanctions is the classic free market strategy. It's like Locke would have been so proud, like, oh, yes, of course. You simply just stop buying, you know? But that's another story. You know, it's criminalized now. Um, but let me go back to the question about gentrification in particular, right? Because um, this is a very, very good question, of, and it's a, very, it's a very long struggle. Because in some ways, uh, what we think of as modern gentrification, that is the last 40 years or so, is ongoing acts of dispossession, and repossession, um, and it's part of a very, very long strategy. Uh, I made that quip about free market ideology because part of the claims about gentrification is that this is simply the free market working, that people with capital, with resources, see an opportunity and they seize it, right? What they don't talk about is the way that, the, that you, know, you mentioned government and state policies, that those very same state policies gave those communities at one point value by virtue of the fact that um, they the were not mixed or predominantly white and they were able to get subsidies from the federal government or higher ratings with the FHA. So there's a way in which the federal government's always been a, a kind of, had a, a kind of racial agenda. Um, it may not be as direct that would sort of 
buttress property values in neighborhoods that are not considered mixed. Right now in LA, one of the big, there's sort of two, there's multiple struggles on gentrification, but the biggest one, the most high profile one is Boyle Heights. And Boyle Heights is a community that was historically very mixed. It was Asian, uh, Jewish, uh, Latino, and black for many, many years. Um, it was hit hard during the period of um, uh, um, internment, where a lot of Japanese owners were forced into internment camps. Um, and then, because it was mixed, the value of property stayed low. You know, in other words, it was very hard to get FHA loans. And as a result of, of I can't go into the whole story, but people began to move out. Um, it became much more Latino community. It became low income. And now, the art community, I say art community is not really art entrepreneurs, <laughs> no, are coming in and trying to develop galleries there, which, we, which everyone knows is the beginning <laughs> of gentrification. Now, um, and, this, and I have to say, the people of Boyle Heights are so militant. Uh -huh. They're so organized, and they're going to win. <laughs> and, and in other words, you can win. You can win these things. Winning is not about the maintenance of poverty. It's not saying we want these neighborhoods to remain exactly the way they are, over-policed, underfunded. No, no one wants that. They want the transformation of these communities without dispossession. That's the thing. Um, and I should say just, you know, one, one sort of side note, I don't want to say too much about this, but I, I was talking to a student recently about the struggle in Boyle Heights, and he made this argument. He says, you know what? Every time artists go into a neighborhood, it always raises the value of the property. And I said, that is not true. I said, first of all, in Boyle Heights, you have a tradition of artists who are there and never left. Long tradition, number one. Number two, um, there was a point of time, again, if you know anything about the history of LA, where you mentioned Inglewood, where other parts of South LA, Central Avenue, for example, um, and 103rd, that was the heart in the 1960s of, a, of an artistic renaissance. You had visual art, you had more visual artists and musicians and theater people in that area on 103rd and Central in the 60s um, than any other part of California per capita. It was an artist, artist haven. The Brockman Gallery was established there. You had amazing sort of um, generative work being done. Property values never went up. Why? Because they were black artists. <laughs> A black owned gallery, you know? And most, most importantly, the federal government pumped a lot of money into that area in two ways. One, the war and poverty money, which is very, very important in terms of establishing certain kinds of institutions, and that's something we should also begin to think about, that there's nothing wrong with um, government support to maintain institutions. Um, when we start to privatize those things, sometimes you, know, you have to kind of pay the piper. Um, so that's one thing. The other source of federal money, and write this down, was the FBI. So the FBI pumped a lot of money into paying people like uh, Dothor Perry, who was an agent provocateur, to burn down the 300-seat theater that was a former Safeway transformed by the community to destroy art that was created in that community. In other words, to wage war on this revolutionary insurgency of the arts and to pump money into local police. So the police and the FBI, COINTELPRO, all destroyed this community as capital flight meant that the, the basic industrial foundation for that community began to disappear. And so we get South Central Los Angeles. Not the South Central where the ghosts of some of the greatest artists on the planet still roam around. The place where the Watts Towers wasn't just like, just there for people from Germany to come check it out, but was very much a part of that community. That whole thing is gone. And so when people try to rebuild that, you know, um, there's always a struggle. So the question is, 
if artistic capital is coming in to a community to gentrify, what are they really doing? You see? So that's why the Bora Heights thing is so important. So that's not so much um, like direction, because I could, I, could I could never give anyone direction what to do. Each struggle is his own. But it is, a, it is, I think, a story that to me is inspiring and reminds us that the transformation of these communities is still necessary, but it doesn't mean you have to dispossess people and it doesn't mean that you have to privatize everything. It means that we need to fight for something a little bit bigger, like a social wage, like the ability to be able to have libraries and schools and art centers that we don't have to turn to a foundation or a corporation to pay for, or that we can have revenues that are fairly shared from government that could actually be used. Because right now, the way revenues produced in most cities is very uneven. You know, and, and I, I can go, I could talk all day about Cincinnati, I could talk all day, we could talk about Seattle. But you know, that's one of the things we have to fight for. It's worth fighting for. But thank you for your question. That's a long ass answer. That's a long you know. <laughs> We're gonna have one more question. Oh, I thought we'd go to nine. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll go extra 15 minutes. I'm, I'm the boss here. Everybody's telling me what to do. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I can't. So, yes, uh, I'll be short. <laughs> I, I just I wanted to make sure that I heard you correctly. Right. You hmm? said that racism was made in black. No, no, no. No, I, I said the opposite, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll, repeat, I'll repeat it because I know this is going to be on your exam. Um, <laughs> so, I want to get the, the quote right, because one of my favorite quotes is from Otis Madison. He says, the purpose of racism is to control the behavior of white people. Because and that's, from the beginning of my talk all the way through, part of what I kept trying to emphasize is that you know, it's the, the buying into the fiction of these essential differences that enables white people to make choices that actually are not about solidarity or transformation, that are about separating and distancing themselves. You know? And so part of what Cedric Robinson's whole project is about, um, he wrote another book, uh, which is called Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, where he talks about the film industry. But part of that has to do with the way that um, racial regimes are, in some ways, unstable they're based on fictions, they're based on mythologies, and that they hide those stories. They're based on a kind of unstable assembly, right? And so when he says the purpose of racism is to control the behavior of white people, it's that white people are willing to make choices that are not necessarily in the interest of the collective because they're afraid of losing. Um, and not black people. That for black people, black people and brown people and people of color for the most part, not all of them, um, don't actually accept the fiction. They don't really accept that they're inferior or second class or that they have to go to certain schools because they can't compete with others. You know, there's some of us who do believe that and write books about it and make a lot of money and they, they teach at places like Stanford, places like that, right? But you know, for the most part, we don't accept the fiction. And, and so the fiction of race, race is so unstable that it's always tottering. It always has to be shored up. And so the shoring up is always, always about trying to reach white people to say, you know what? Those people, if they move into your neighborhood, your property values are going to decline. Those people, if they come to, if, you know, if you're, if you're an off-duty cop and, and someone, and you cut somebody off, and you're sitting in your car, and they come to your window, most likely, if they're black, he's armed, and you've got to kill him right away. And a, ju and a jury, I'm talking about a recent case, and the jury would decide, you know what, of course. And the dude got off, right? So that's, that's the point, that, that in fact, racism is, in some ways, about controlling behavior of those who, see, who, are, who are told, somehow, that they are normal if not superior, and all the rest are driven by other things. So therefore, um, when he says 
that racism is not for black people. He doesn't say that racism is not for black people. He's saying that state violence is the way, is, is another means to control. That's what he's saying. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I hear you on that, and I think, I think there's some truth to that. But on the other hand, given the way that racism works, there, there's a certain logic to that, yeah. that certain people may not have the same educational background or the same tools or the same resources as other people, right? And that's, in other words, that's not sort of saying that I'm inferior or that person's inferior. That's recognizing structural racism and how it functions, right? So I'm not saying that there, in fact, the fact that there are people who do buy into that, Kevin Orr, you know, or, you know, Darnell earlier, two examples of people who see themselves as race men, who see themselves as essentially Democrats and not even conservatives. I mean, they also see that, um, like a lot of people in our community, and Bill Cosby was like himself a mouthpiece for this, that, yeah, we're, we're killing ourselves. We're, we're undermining our own situation. Sure, I, I agree with you on that. The problem is, is that when it comes time, in times of crisis, to recognize injustice, who is the ones in the street? Who's in the street, right? Meaning, who's in the street? Who's, who is who's basically resisting police? Right? Who is in the street um, and why are they in the street? Well, part of the industry, because, and what are they dealing with? And part of the point is, is that for those kinds of oppositions and rebellions, they end up getting state violence in a way that other people don't. Right? That they don't. Um, there's a certain kind of complacency that much of the, those who are not victims of, of day-to-day -day -day state violence, let alone the spectacular forms, um, don't have to deal with the police. You know, don't have to deal with um, these kinds of day-to-day -day inequalities because it's taken as common sense. You know? So at some point, and this is Cedric Grobson's whole point, is that the fictions are so weak that even at some point they become revealed. Even if you believe them, they're moments of revelation, which means that they have to continually change. And that's why there's no such thing as a fixed racial ideology, a fixed system of white supremacy that just is unchanging. It's always being reproduced, being fixed, being, put, being repaired, because it has so many holes. And that's part of the issue. I know someone had their hand up. Who else? One more. One more. OK. <laughs> oh. Yeah, please. you stand up, please? Now, is this specifically about Detroit or just generally? Well, you know, this rapid job loss has always been a threat, even in times um, of expansion. You know, the threat of it, I mean, part, part, of, part of the, um, uh, the, the whole reason for actually organizing unions is to be able to protect the collective from the depredations of the employer, 
<coughs> and whether those depredations are lowering wages or letting people off, or most importantly, historically, uh, the use of automation, for example. So the same question that you raised today, that was the question in 1968. But it wasn't about capital flight, it was about automation. Automation was a huge, huge issue. Um, if you, the same question's being raised in the 1930s, you know, around downsizing, um, because of the contraction of the economy, for example. So it's like always, always a threat. Um, the sad thing is that when you ask this question in 2017, um, Trade unions, labor unions are just a fraction of what they used to be, you know, in terms of power. And um, I should say, use this opportunity to, to advertise my great friend, Michael Honey, who's here. So his book, To the Promised Land, Martin Luther King uh, and the Fight for Economic Justice, is a brilliant book coming out April 2018. You've got to get it. In fact, order it now. Um, and it's, to the, it's, it's called To the Promised Land. Michael Honey, he's, he's actually right there. Great, great, brilliant scholar, filmmaker. So one of the things that he talks about in terms of King's ec economic vision of justice was not, not just the Poor People's Campaign, but even the rights of labor. He edited a book about you know, King's speeches on labor. So, he, so in some ways, even in the moment of expansion of the economy, the need to have strong unions and organize and have a, a certain um, uh, d democratic um, uh, buy-in, I should say, because it's not just unions, it's also about being able for democracy to work. Um, just the mere fact that, that King was worried about the future of the poor and the working class in the time of expansion. So jump to 2017, when everything is contracting, where um, income inequality is at its, it's, it's really continuing to rise, uh, where tax policy is about the continuation of upward um, uh, redistribution of wealth, uh, where um, we, some people fetishize the so-called share economy as if it's about sharing and not about precarious low-wage labor, you know? <laughs> You know, because sharing means that you're driving down the street, you see someone who needs a ride, so you need a ride here, get in the car, and you take them. That's, this, this is not what we're talking about. So the fact that you have these other alternatives to wage, to um, what, we, what we thought of in the past as solid union living wage labor, and the alternative to that is driving Uber or something like that. The fact that these alternatives pop up which only produce greater precarity is important. On the other hand, I have to say, and this is why I'm so hopeful, that it's not in those jobs that were considered long-standing, um, sort of solid union jobs that we see the most activity. We see a lot of activity in the very low-wage, precarious jobs, the fight for 15 fast food workers, they're Kmart workers, they're waging the struggle to say that, you know what, you know, we're not only going to try to unionize, but we're going to fight to get um, state and federal and local laws that will guarantee us a minimum wage. So now it's not simply between labor and capital, but it's saying that we need government to participate in this. What we used to call in the old days a social wage. I use the word social wage and people are like, all the young people are like, I never heard that term before. You know? The idea that somehow um, we should live in a, in a society, a social democratic society, that provides a certain baseline for everybody, right? And so the 5 to 15 is part of that, saying we need a certain baseline. The, the demand for basic income, whatever limitations and problems that produces, that also is part of that struggle to say we don't need to depend on this company and beg this company so we keep our jobs. Because people are tired of giveaways. And, I'm sorry, I'm almost done. So, <laughs> and I'll give you a really good example. And again, not to, to jump on Obama, but when Obama bailed out you know, General Motors, which he's heroic for, part of that bailout involved a huge give back 
in terms of the next generation taking like a 50% cut in wages. Huge wage cuts. It meant that you're basically guaranteeing starvation wages in a precarious labor force. It may not be as bad as other, but it's still not what people fought for. And the fact that people had to sort of beg for these jobs, or to say, you know what, at least you have a job, you could be working in China, as if somehow we don't really care about Chinese workers. And we should be raising wages around the globe, right? This is the kind of stuff that we should be fighting for. So it requires thinking totally differently about what does it mean to lose a job? What does it mean to think of alternatives that are not about the share economy in terms of individual workers working for a company, but what does it mean to, to move towards worker cooperatives, for example? We've got you know, 400 some odd worker cooperatives now. Um, what does it mean for workers to own what they, not only own the means, but can make decisions about their uh, work patterns, work styles, and work hours. And that's the future we have to imagine, which is a very, very different future from saying, oh, let me, let me elect a president who promises to bring back jobs, as if somehow that's our answer. So it's an excellent question, but without a broader imagination, we're going to be stuck thinking about how do we make sure those firms stay in place. And once you do that, the story of General Motors is proof. They'll stay there for a while until they can fleece the city and fleece all the other people, then they'll cut out. And that's not the kind of economy we need. It's certainly not the kind of economy that King envisioned. So I'll stop there.